Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to um, pivot a little bit on topics. I know you've had a lot of didactic, extremely important information so far about oncology and changing oncology practices. Um, but I'm going to talk about something, maybe you're sick of hearing about it, but physician burnout. I know that there is a, a lot to be said about the actual terminology. Um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit as well. But again, I'm Shema Master Cosme. Um, I'm a medical oncologist, hematologist, and I currently work at the Penn Abramson Cancer Center in New Jersey. So, you know, I do have some slides, but I'd like to talk a bit off the cuff if that's okay. But I, I do like to set the stage and, and discuss physician burnout with the understanding of what is it that we're talking about? What is the definition of this? Um, again, there's many, many words that we can use such as moral injury that may be more appropriate because almost the word burnout implies victim blaming and I really don't like that either. But be that as it may, this is the word that's most recognized and most people can relate to what it is that I'm talking about. So Christina Maslach developed the model um, that was a three-dimensional um, that includes emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a diminished sense of personal, uh, personal accomplishment. So how many in the audience have ever experienced these? If you're not raising your hand, I can't see you. Um, then you just don't want to perhaps acknowledge these feelings or haven't recognized these uh, as uh, what they are. Um, we know that uh, there's many, many different definitions of burnout, but this uh, mass lock inventory is actually the most um, utilized and really correlates a lot with other inventory scales. So that's generally the one I like to use to talk about this, this disease, this epidemic. Um, how many of us can relate to these sentences, right? We might not know what emotional exhaustion means or depersonalization or this diminished sense of personal accomplishment, but how many times do you come home and go, I feel completely used up. I feel at the end of my rope. When I come home to my three children and they want me emotionally, um, I don't have it in me in certain days. On certain days, I just want to go to my room when I get home, have a cup of tea, put my feet up, maybe do a five minute meditation, but I need to unwind. I'm exhausted from giving empathy and kindness and, and, and attention to patients all day, which they deserve and I love to give. I feel exhausted from having to contain my emotions at work so I'm not perceived as angry and emotional because, you know, um, as a woman, you have to be more composed, uh, even in the face of, of, of craziness. <laughs> so yeah, I feel emotionally exhausted at the end of my day. Um, what about depersonalization? Um, this is a dangerous one. You know, I, I thank goodness I've not experienced this, but you know, it may also present as cynicism. You know, this whole idea of I don't really care what happens to some patients. That's maybe we don't say that. I, I hope we don't, but I think it's almost like, well, yeah, their chemo was denied, and yeah, sure, it was denied. Well, I'll have to do a peer to peer. They'll probably deny it. Oh, well. Because after the first few dozen and then a hundred denials for imaging and chemo that we really strongly believe a patient deserves and needs, it erodes us. It erodes us morally, and we can't take that pain anymore. And so it's easier to say, well, okay, it was denied. All right, we'll try and we'll have to think of something else if, it, if the insurance won't pay for it, right? So some of this is important from protecting ourselves, but it can get really dangerous to where it really minimizes your, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that leads to this diminished sense of personal accomplishment. No matter how important we are to our patients, I think we start believing that we're not making as much of a difference as we want. Sometimes we don't get the feedback we need to have this acknowledged, right? I, I don't feel I'm as effective in caring for the patients as I wish I could be because we have barriers, we have 
administrators who may decide how long we get to spend with patients, how many patients we see in a day. We have insurances that decide how we treat our patients and a whole host of um, uh, factors that inhibit this. So these three things can really make the case for burnout. And, and I could tell you that these are the statistics from you know, a little while ago. And it says 47% of oncologists experience some form of burnout. I'm gonna say that it's most of us. I'm gonna say it's far higher, far higher than this. And, and COVID hasn't helped, right? COVID has really, really um, escalated our burnout. Um, we're behind a mask. We have way more restrictions. We can't even touch our patients. That used to bring me so much joy to be able to hug, hold the hand um, and provide comfort. And it provided me some comfort as well. We just have a lot more on our plate even now than before. And so I think most of us in this room um, are definitely feeling some degree of burnout. Burnout's not a black or white, all or none phenomenon, it's a continuum. And in and, and some days it's worse than others. So it can even change day by day, hour by hour. Even fellows graduating um, fellowship haven't even really begun their careers are experiencing burnout. So it tells you also, what our medical education system is and how much of the responsibility lays there and how much they need to start talking about emotional mental health um, of the, the healers, us, early on. And I think they're starting to do that, um, which, is, which is really great. And this goes without showing, it's getting worse, right? I don't have to show you a chart to tell you that burnout is getting worse everywhere. This is the year of the great resignation and, and uh, physicians, oncologists are not an exception. People are leaving medicine in droves, especially physicians. Um, and that's really a problem, not just for us, obviously, for the whole community as a whole. Um, and then, of course, we've had a huge impact um, with COVID, uh, with decrease in revenues, um, layoffs, furloughs. This may have been more applicable in 2020, 2021. Things started to rev back up. But Really, the effect of being laid off, um, and then you know, so many practices shut down temporarily, and then this remote patient engagement has increased, which in some ways has been great, but in some other ways, I think patients have discovered a way to communicate with us through the portals, which again is is difficult. We don't have the time or the bandwidth to always meet their demands that way with a full caseload during the day and. So it gets harder, and of course, compensation is harder. We don't we don't get compensated for replying um, and getting through our inboxes, right? So where does it all go wrong for us? Um, you know, I think that it all starts out really, really right. Most of us, all of us, went into medicine, I believe, to serve, to be fantastic, excellent at what we do. We want to cure people. We want to make people better, and we have tremendous compassion. I believe all of us went into medicine with all these fantastic characteristic traits. And then, you know, this idea of service can go so overboard. You know, I, I know when I trained through medical school residency, it was a badge of honor to not have slept more than two, three hours the night before. It was like, oh, I only got two hours of sleep. Oh, I did a 48 hour call. You did a 36. Oh, I did even worse. So it was almost like a badge of honor to be more sleep deprived, to be at the hospital more, to work more than anyone else, to give more when you have nothing to give. So this idea of self deprivation starts in the beginning as something to be aspiring to, something to be proud of. And, and self care, I mean, that would be laughable if that was even mentioned back when I trained, That's, that wasn't a thing. I'm glad it is now that people are talking about the fact that you can't give from an empty cup. You really have to fill you, yourself up. So it leads to exhaustion. I was, my personal journey, I was physically and mentally exhausted. You give your 100%, 150% during training, right? Most of us really wanna be the best and we wanna show up earlier than the residents when you met students to round. We pre-round and then round and then round again. And, we really, really want to be better than we compete with each other and we just exhaust ourselves. And that's what we believe is normal when we get into practice. And so add to that, you know, a family. I have three children, a dog, 
Add to that all of that, giving 150% to everyone, including my work, doesn't mathematically work. It just doesn't work. And after all, I'm a human being and I was, I was at wit's end. I was exhausted. I was an unhappy, miserable person. Um, part of it is because the expectation level I had of myself. And this excellence, this drive for perfection at work too, right? I would say yes to everything um, because everything's an opportunity for me to make a name for myself in the organization. I wanted everyone around me to be able to rely on me to be on that committee, to work on that project, to run that clinical trial. Yes, and, and to be told, wow, I don't know how you do it all was such a thrill, um, but it led to anxiety. Can I do it all? Do I have enough time? When do I fit this? When do I meet this deadline? And so that increases significant anxiety, which makes us more agitated. And, you know, of course, in, in medicine, especially in oncology, we have this drive to always make patients better. Um, we want to cure them. We don't want to make any mistakes. We want to make sure we're looking at every option of, of therapy. Um, you know, I, I still have colleagues and maybe some are in the audience who give their personal cell phone numbers to their patients because they're so, so dedicated to their job. And to not give that, it's almost, again, another badge of honor. All my patients have my cell phone number. Well, my patients don't. And there's a reason for that. Um, when I'm not on call, when I'm not available, when I'm with my family, I can't really truly give the patients what they deserve when they call me or text me. And I really am doing my family a disservice at the same time. So it makes more sense for someone who's on call to take that burden even if it's my partner. Um, and so to split that commitment is really important um, for your own um, really just recovery and be able to get back in and give your all, right? So again, it's, it's very commendable. It's almost another badge of like, gosh, I'm so good at what I do and I'm so dedicated that I do that. And, and that's great if that works for you, but I really think that there is a, a, a line that gets crossed um, when we mix work and family life and it all gets intermingled. And, and I don't have to tell you about compassion. I mean, we do these difficult conversations every day, life and death, every single day. Um, patients are dying, patients we've known for years, maybe we've seen them weekly for years and then there's not much left. And, and we feel emotionally isolated after exhibiting and exuding so much compassion and empathy throughout the day you come home and, and your children are mad because you made mac and cheese and God, they wanted lasagna and they hate dinner and dinner's the worst. And, and, and comparatively in your head, you're thinking, is that your biggest problem? Like I literally put a 30 year old uh, in home hospice today. And for them, yeah, that is the biggest problem because what we do is in their life. And so our ability to exhibit compassion and empathy for other things that are less serious um, becomes diminished and we tend to withdraw, we tend to depersonalize. And I think that's, that's really dangerous as well. So these are sort of the, you know, these things, these are what bothers us. These are the things that make us crazy, rules, regulations, EMR, oh gosh, you know, can you click anymore? Not getting reimbursed, working long hours, difficult patients. Um, that's a small percentage, you know, I think that's few and far between usually, but I think patients are also frustrated with the system and they end up taking a lot out on us that we don't control. Um, the worry about being sued and, and other things. So 4% of us are really lucky to be not worried about anything. <laughs> so I hope uh, those people are in the audience today, but most of us have this. So I always talk about burnout as a continuum, right? I, I it's not one specific thing and it, it's not is or isn't there. Um, it's always going to be there at some degree unless you really you know, have it all together and you're working part-time and have a wonderful, wonderful balance. Um, you know, absenteeism, not showing up to those tumor boards and those meetings that are optional, just not feeling as satisfied, maybe telling your kids don't go into medicine. That's like a subtle way of, of acknowledging that you're just, you burned out decrease self-esteem, putting yourself down, um, making mistakes. You know, I think 
that is something we don't do well with uh, as perfectionist type A uh, people in general, um, as most doctors are, this idea of making a mistake is, is scary, increases so much anxiety. And we're not used to saying, hey, we're human, we make mistakes, it's okay, acknowledge them, move on not sleeping obviously these are some of them overlap with sort of typical depression symptoms you know this is all correlated withdrawal isolation decreased productivity because you're not focusing irritability i was so angry i was angry all the time um angry at the system angry at frustrated angry with everything and um it, it affected the team and affected patients, I'm sure. And, you know, it took me a while to recognize that as burnout in myself. Um, exhaustion and never underestimate um, suicidal thoughts. You know, we are sort of the, the, the uh, you know, the example of success in society for most of our colleagues and friends. And, you know, parents, we're, we've ha we have it all. We're successful physicians. We have jobs and money why would that lead to suicidal thoughts? You know, don't forget over 400 physicians commit suicide annually, 400. That's more than one a day. That means there's equal or more number who think about it, who might attempt it that don't succeed, right? And so this is really, really scary. We're alone. Um, we also don't seek help because, um, Licensing authorities and, and credentialing organizations certainly seek those um, things out, and we don't want to have to report that in any way because, of course, that is potential for not getting a job or, or being perceived differently. It's very private, and so most of us who need help don't, don't get help, and, and that's a real big problem. We tell patients to get help, and we don't. So we are sick, and we can't get the help we need. This can lead to relationship difficulties at home or at work, and of course, excessive use of alcohol. We have access to all kinds of drugs, right? Anesthesiologists and surgeons and have all kinds of drugs that they can have access to, um, feeling detached. And this feeling, this feeling of dread before going to work, what's the feeling you have in the morning when you're driving to work? Is it, I'm excited to tackle my day, like, what's my day going to be like? Or, oh, God, I wish I didn't have to go today. Tune into that, listen to yourself. You know, organizations only care about burnout when it affects their bottom line. This affects their bottom line. And so for anyone who wants to make an argument um, to tackle this, what I will say to organizations, health organizations, insurance companies, everyone, uh, big hospital systems, this costing you a lot of money, two to $6 billion a year, um, and that includes things like physician turnover. It, it takes a quarter million dollars just to turn over a physician um, and reduce productivity in so many, you know, increase litigation. Um, so this, this affects the bottom line and this is a big problem and they better start paying attention. So it goes without saying, you know, what are, what are the work system factors that increase our, our risk of burning out? Um, the demands on one end, and, and what are the resources that can mitigate some of these issues? Excessive workload, right? Schedules, you know, 10 minutes per patient, things like that. Uh, poor staffing, not having help. So you have to go room a patient because you don't have MAs or nurses, or you're doing administrative work, faxing things, writing letters, when really your time is best spent being a clinician, administrative burden, certain things you have to do, you know, every time you get an EMR, you have to have pathway compliance and then you're retrained again into sort of you know um you know are you staging everyone what's your staging percentage what, what it, there's just more and more and more what's your workflow like how often are you interrupted um with things and doing your workday distractions and then technology the type of emr you have the emr that i had in my last job was horrible horrible and not user-friendly at all and just was just not usable and now it's so much better. So that makes so much difference. It just makes you more efficient. Time pressure and less personal time. Are you having time to have a bite to eat for lunch? Are you working through lunch and you just 
not even getting up to go to the bathroom? Are you feeling this sense of moral distress because everything you want to do for your patients is hitting a brick wall, either with institutions or um, insurance companies? Patient factors, don't underestimate that. You know, there are certain types of uh, oncology practices where certain types of patients are more time consuming and emotionally distressed and need a lot of us um, than certain malignancies. So I think patient factors weigh in, patient satisfaction scores. I mean, I guess, you know, those are hard, right? How do you totally satisfy patients who are terminal? Um, and, and you can't give them the cure that they want. So there's an expectation misalignment sometimes as well. And so it's not really you, but, you know, I really don't like patient satisfaction scores being tied to, to payment, but Medicare has done this. And um, so we have a lot to fight. There are certain things though, that I think can help balance this, this reminding ourselves the meaning and the purpose of what we do what we do besides the EMR clicking and the pathway um, engagement and all that. What do we do? What are we really doing? And to that patient in that room, what do you mean? Um, and we forget, but we mean a lot to them. Uh, we do a lot for them. The organizational culture, what is that like? Um, when you're overstressed and you need an adjustment in your schedule, how amenable is your office manager? When, when you make a mistake in writing a chemo, how, how much does the pharmacist weigh in and, and, and help you fix that? And how much of a, you know, a safety net do you have with things? What are the alignment of values and expectations with your partners, uh, your coworkers? Um, and how much control do you have and flexibility and autonomy? Most of us have families. We have unexpected things happen. You know, children get sick, spouses need help, parents are old and get sick we have to have the ability to be there for them and yet be able to do our work. And, and how flexible is that? How is that received at your workplace? What are the rewards? What do you want as a reward? What do you consider reward? You know, I will tell you a little story of myself um, that for me, this, um, this uh, acknowledgement of, of my work, um, almost a, feedback, positive feedback was my lifeline. Um, I relied on a lot of that, you know, administrators telling me I'm doing a great job. I have, you know, the patient satisfaction scores being high. That's what I measured my worth with all the time. And in my institution, the administrators changed so frequently. Um, and slowly over time, they I didn't really even know them. They didn't really even know me. And there was very little communication except for, you know, the bottom line stuff. And my sense of self-worth kept getting lower and I felt not appreciated. How many of us do we not feel appreciated at work or home really anywhere? And I had a wonderful coach that once asked me a very simple question. He said, who defines your worth? wait, what? Do I get to decide who defines my worth? Of course, it's my employer. And he said, wrong answer. He said, the only person who defines your worth is you. Your relationship with your employer is purely a contractual one where you provide a service for a mutually um, acceptable you know, payment that works for both parties until it doesn't, until they don't need you or you don't want them. There is nothing about your worth in there. And so this was probably the most important moment of my career where I recognized that my self-worth is defined by me. Obviously, my employer pays me, but really I don't look for that adoration, that, that you know, pat in the back. Um, from them because that's not their job and I shouldn't rely on that to feel proud of myself. So it's really, really important to take that back. I'd given that power away of what I'm worth, what I'm capable of and what I do and what I do in and of itself is, is worth everything. And I don't need that. Congratulations. That's great. It's nice to have it, but it's not necessary. Um, professional relationships, social support. I can't tell you how important this is. 
I have colleagues that I can text when I'm feeling down, friends, be able to be, you know, run cases by them. There are these wonderful Facebook groups. Of course, there might be uh, women in the audience who are part of it, the physician mommy group, and there is a, um, a specific hemong physician women's group. We call ourselves the Wolf Pack, but it's a really a wonderful professional support, social support. We talk about cases anonymously, of course. We talk about our personal struggles, um, both professionally, personally, um, and it's really just great. These are the hands on the back that you need when you're getting through life and when you feel down. And it's good to create even an online relationship with people that get you. I think it's super important. That's one good thing social media has done. And then work-life integration, right? If you only get one pie, it's 24 hours. It's really 16 if you really believe in any kind of sleep hygiene. It's all you get, so everyone gets, you know, break it up into what you think is most important. I think of it often, and because we're oncologists, we're morbid, I think of it as what's gonna be said at my, at my funeral? What's my eulogy? Um, you know, we talk to patients about end of life all the time, and I have yet to meet one who regrets not having worked more. Um, but so what are the things that I'm, going to be remembered for? Do I want to be remembered for? What are the things that my life is really about? Um, if it is work, wonderful, you know, adjust your pie just right and change based on what stage of life you're in. But do that deliberately. Don't make that be a default, um, someone else's job. Um, so these, some job resources, meaning and purpose at work, you really I'm not gonna go through a lot of this because we talked about this already. Um, I have certain personal strategies that I use to combat burnout, but there's just so many based on what is it that you need, right? So I'm just gonna list them here, but first of all, recognize that this is happening, please. Um, and, and remember the signs and then proactively plan that pie. Remember I talked to you about this pie that you only have so much room. What is the purpose of your life? What's your vision? Get your support groups. They are invaluable. And then, of course, we talk about time management strategies, you know, how to get more efficient with your note-taking, your EMR. Is it a, a, a scribe? Is it, you know, your dictation system? Would you like to have your templates? What is it? Spend some time, try to get more efficient. And then identify your triggers that really make you unhappy um, and, and plan to make changes around those and recognize them. And I really think at home, uh, it, organization is really important. Um, I don't want to be sexist, but really more important for women who bear a big burden of organization at home and in home life. So have regular family meetings and have your children who are growing up pitch in more spouses. And, you know, I'm all about outsourcing as much as I can afford. If I don't enjoy it, I don't need to be doing it. So I don't enjoy cleaning the house. Somebody else can do that. I don't enjoy laundry. Somebody else can do that and I can pay them and it's worth it. But I do enjoy cooking. So that's not something I'm going to outsource all the time. So you have to decide what that is and don't feel guilty about it. Do not. <laughs> and then never forget to disconnect. You know, we're all so tuned in all the time with our work phone, cell phone, we feel like things are going to fall apart if we're not there. They're not. They're not. Have a good backup system that you can completely disconnect and, and really try to have some fun. You know, we do hard work and we deserve it. So this is sort of the pie I had talked about. All of the things that we think about all the time and things we don't think about uh, a lot. So, of course, we think about, right, your work. But it, what about your volunteer involvement? Uh, what about your spiritual, personal growth? romance, um, social life, friends, hobbies, what are those? What's time for those? Physical and health um, and family and your inner circle. And of course, your financial independence also weighs very, very heavy for your personal uh, well-being. So I, again, I'm not going to go over the institutional um, uh, options of, of things that we could do during the institution because I'm running out of time. But there are a lot of ways um, that administrators can get involved and, and physicians in administrative positions can get involved, uh, knowing their bottom line, bottom line is being hurt in order to help physicians. And it's not a you know, wellness session uh, on your own time or a yoga session. That's insulting. Um, and, and I have a problem with those. 
So these are the take home points. Uh, burnout is a very serious problem. One in two chance you already have it, um, I would say more and recognizing it, um, better personal strategies and, and being able to voice this in organizations. So it's not being shoved under a rug and starting as early as medical education to address this during training and making it okay to have self-care. And you don't have to quit medicine to tackle burnout. And I hope you don't, because we need you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate all of your time today.